Hi, welcome to the Ebook Revolution podcast. I'm Jeff Hughes, and uh, we're here to talk about all things entrepreneur and writing and publishing. And uh, I'm very happy to have as my guest today, uh, Mr. Bill O'Hanlon. How are you, Bill? I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, very well. I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, talking to you at, at a different day than your day down there. I've been to Australia, and I've crossed that date line a few times. All right. Uh, I'm pleased that you're um, escaped the uh, the new ice age that seems to have descended on the east coast over there. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I have really sunny. It's a little windy right at the moment because it's just getting the end of the evening, but we've had really sunny days here. and There is a little snow on the ground because I live in the mountains, but it's mostly melted off. So uh, it's a nice place I live. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the world, though I haven't been. I've been to Arizona, where I met you a few years ago. Right, uh, Jeff, right. Jeff well, if you see a lot of cowboy movies, some of them, and more, uh, more recently other movies, are made around where I live, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the USA. Yeah, it was my first trip there a few years ago, and I fell in love with the country, and I can't wait oh, to get back. Beautiful, beautiful but, um, place. Just, just reading from your uh, bio, Bill, from uh, your your website, Bill uh, B- BillOhanlon.com uh, for our listeners who might want to have a look. And just to explain who you are, who you are, uh, you're a dynamic, inspirational, professional speaker, prolific author, thirty books, and um, that's what we're going to be talking about later. Your book writing and publishing course. You also help motivate people, organisations. Um, Bill's trained as a psychotherapist and he's known for his collaborative, respectful approach, a reverent humour. <laughs> we all need some humour. Storytelling, clear, accessible presentation style. I hope you don't mind me just reading off your bio, but I'm basically essentially oh, lazy, Bill. And <laughs> reading your bio um, just makes me feel even more inadequate. <laughs> do, do, do you have a philosophy of life? What, what's Bill's philosophy that, that drives well, you? Well, ca- yes, I called my company Possibilities when I uh, started it, and I suppose that's the closest thing I have to a philosophy that's coherent because I follow a lot of philosophies and have a lot of interests in different areas, which is, I guess, consistent with possibilities. Um, I think that there are two pieces to my f- possibility philosophy and one is you got to acknowledge what's going on and what's happening right now with you and the world and your conditions and then step into the possibilities and just follow those where you go and your inner world and your intuition and your dreams and desires will give you a direction and the possibilities once you step into them the world will tell you which ones are doable and how to get there the world is your guru is what i say if you take action if you don't take action the world can't teach you anything no i find that interesting and and, and you're you're quite right and i think that also drives uh the creative um urge as well i mean you're you're very creative yourself um anybody that's listening that uh maybe a, a friend of Bill on, on Facebook. I don't know if people need to be your friend to see your Facebook music videos, but just for some background, Bill um, impressively posts a music video. He's an accomplished musician every single day. Now, I'm just in awe of this. What What's the story behind those daily Facebook music videos? Well, I'm yeah, talking to another author, publisher, creative person, musician, so I guess we're in the same boat. Takes one to know one. Um, I, I, I'm in my 60s, and I've had an amazingly blessed life, for which I'm grateful. I, I was kind of messed up when I was younger, and I found my way in my 20s, late 20s, mid to late 20s, and I went on to be a psychotherapist as a career, and then I started writing and speaking all over the world, and I traveled millions of miles, uh, teaching three or four times a month, and about four or five years ago, I decided had time to stay home, and I, you and I met because we were were interested in how to do online marketing and we met in a program that was really teaching that that was you know since I'm not a digital native that was a challenge for me and I'm sure a bit of a challenge for you but I learned this online marketing and I was able to free up my time enough and I got off the road which I was you know doing public speaking and publicizing my books I got off the road and I do online coaching and, and training at this point and all of a sudden I had more than enough time 
for the first time in my life because I was terrible with money when I was younger and even in my middle of my life I had enough money and I still have a great deal of energy and as you say I have creative urges and I thought well you know I've gotten way past where I wanted to go what's left and I had two things that emerged I've written 35 nonfiction books and I wanted to write a novel which I've had in mind for a while and I'm about a third of the way through that and I I've been writing songs and playing music since I was very young, but I've been writing songs since I was about 16. And as I mentioned, I'm in my 60s, and I thought, I would like to be a professional songwriter. So every day I post a song to be comfortable putting music out on the, on the in the public because I've been mostly playing at home, and I occasionally, I used to have rock groups when I was younger and used to play singer-songwriter stuff out when I was in college. And... Um, but I haven't really played out for a long time, so I just made myself sit down and do a song a day. I know about a thousand songs. I love music of all kinds, and uh, you know, today I just posted a blues, and yesterday was a you know a rock song by Prince, and you know done in my acoustic style. And so I have an eclectic taste, and I decided, well, I'm going to get it out there, and this will lead into what we're talking about today for authors and uh, authorpreneurs. You need to find a way to get visible, and you might as well find something you love to do to be be able to get visible. And so, people who are following my music, uh, song of the day videos on Facebook, I just put on there about three or four days ago. Hey, I've got this new uh, free series on how to write a book, and I got a bunch of people because they've been following my videos go there. And so, I think. If you're going to do something, you should do it regularly. Once a day is a little insane, but I have a great deal of time in my life. And um, maybe once a week or once uh, every couple of weeks or, you know, once every week and a half. As long as it's regular, be getting yourself out there in the world and finding the people who are attracted to weirdos like you. You know, uh, the people who like my music are attracted to weirdos like me, and I need to find my tribe of other weirdos <laughs> who uh, particularly enjoy my type of weirdness. So that's part of that. So it's two twofold. One is I want to get my music out there, and I, I really have a great passion and joy for this. And the second thing is to increase my visibility. That's what we're going to be talking about for the authors today. Yeah, you, you've you've hit on that because it's um it's important for I, I I bang on a bit and that's the purpose of this podcast about becoming an entrepreneur for new writer and the importance of um creating a platform yes. and you know obviously your your daily music videos is just one part of your extensive platform where people can find you and it's just so important for people to yeah as you said put put themselves out there. And and, yes. not, and not hide away and wait for you know the tap on the shoulder. Well, you know, and I actually was just interacting with someone today who said, "Oh, I don't think I can be an author because I I'm really uncomfortable. I have a fear of speaking." And I thought, who in the age of the internet needs to be a public speaker to sell books? Um, because you could be a blogger if you really love to hide in your room, not talk to anybody, and write, which a lot of authors do. They're a little solitary. It's a solitary thing. Then you should be writing, and you should write about what you have great deal of energy for and get it out there in the world and get people to know you and be visible. And then when your book comes along or if your book is already out, you can also say, hey, and I have a book. And, that, and that's and publishing. I'm, I'm interested in the story about how you got your first book published, Bill. I mean, you've, you've um, published over 30, um, yes. which is an extraordinary output, um, Tell me the story about that first one. What, what was that like? How, how did that come about? Well, I wasn't really... Uh, I loved reading when I was younger, but I did not think I would ever be an author. I, I actually thought authors were sort of like celebrities, you know, movie stars. I just didn't ever imagine myself being an author. I, just, I don't know what I thought, but I thought they were of a different species than I was. You know, and I just wasn't in that category. Like, I wouldn't be in the category of being a movie star. I just couldn't imagine it. But... When I was younger, I became a therapist. I had been depressed when I was younger. I came out of that depression. When I became a therapist, I was 
actually a little upset, not a little upset, very upset, that my field that I'd chosen, I thought, I'll go into this to help other people who are like me. I was depressed. I almost killed myself. And I thought, well, I'll help other people that are like me, that were like me. And um, when I got into the field, I found it was kind of discouraging. They were mostly focused on what was wrong with people. Mostly therapy took a long time, years of psychoanalysis and going back to your childhood and figuring out everything that was had ever traumatized you. And I thought, that's not the way I came out of now. I had depression. That just seems, I would have died if I'd had to go through years of therapy. I couldn't even... Hmm get myself to a therapist first but if I had I couldn't afford it and then the third thing was I wouldn't have stuck with it for two years I wouldn't have taken two years or a year of more misery I had to get out of it more quickly than that so I got kind of upset I guess if you wanted to use the rude word I got pissed off and I wanted to change my field and here I was a, a new therapist you know a baby therapist really if you want to think about it and I started arguing with my colleagues and my professors at university when I was learning therapy because I just didn't buy this stuff and I was thinking there's got to be another way I, you know what's what's right with people where are their strengths and their abilities what helps them move along why does it have to take years and my colleagues would just say you know when I became a therapist and I worked at a clinic they'd just say what do you know you know like just shut up basically you're young you don't know anything and I was so frustrated I thought well who do people listen to they don't listen to the guy who just got out of graduate school and just became a therapist. They listen to the people who write books and speak. Those are the experts. And so, I, when I had that realization, I was, oh, no, I'm sunk. I don't want to be an author. You know, I can't be an I don't know how to be an author. I don't know the first thing about it. I'm a little hyper. I don't want to sit down and write. I love to read, but I just don't know how to do that. And I was terrified of public speaking. So, neither of those seem <laughs> good plans, but my passion was so much greater for this these ideas that I started to come across that were alternate ideas for therapy, and my frustration was great enough to overcome my personal flaws and limitations and major fears and inadequacies. So, it, I sort of got pulled into it, but the practical thing was and this, there's a lesson in this, I think, for authorpreneurs and ebook uh, authors. I started to, I, I had a particular kind of therapy I was interested in, um, and I started a newsletter about that therapy. Nobody gave me permission. Nobody paid me a dime. It took a lot of time. It was a lot of work. I had a full-time job already. I had a busy life, but I was so passionate about this. I wanted to get the word out about this approach and that I did that for a couple of years and I got visible because of that because I was doing this newsletter and I got a bunch of subscribers who were really interested in the same kind of approach and then I uh, I stopped that and I moved to a different place and someone else who knew I had that newsletter asked me to do another newsletter again an unpaid position but a much more visible position said hey you did that other newsletter will you do one for our organization I was like sure fine and I started to put in that newsletter news of my um, workshops which I started to do my speaking engagements and someone at a conference said you know I've seen your workshops I really want to publish books it was a publisher he approached me in a comp professional conference and said I've seen your workshops I know you know a lot about this uh, subject because you're the newsletter editor who are some great new authors because we want to publish in this area and I gave him the name of four or five up and coming people and then I said and then there's me and he said, oh, you want to write? And I said, yeah, I have five books in mind. And he said, five? All I want is one. What? Send, you know, tell me about them. And I told him about them. He said, send me a letter outlining the book. And he sent me an offer for contract. So it was kind of magical. And, you know, I thought, wow, wow. You know, I, I got a little spiritual. I guess God wants me to be an author. That's why he did this. He made it so easy. But it really wasn't, I mean, I'm sure God had something to do with it, if you believe that kind of stuff. But I think it was 
because there's a little more practical reason. I was editing a newsletter that was seen by thousands of people, and I was speaking two or three times a month. Um, and I was seeing between 60 and 200 people every time I spoke. So I had, as you and I will talk a little later, about platform. I had a platform. Yeah, definitely. I didn't know what a platform was, and the word wasn't invented. It wasn't one of the jargon words in publishing at that time. But... He could tell that if he went to a university professor who had better credentials than I, that that person might see 100 people a year in their classes or 200 people a year. And I was seeing two or 300 people a month. Sometimes if I did a keynote, I would see thousands of people. So I didn't realize it, but I had a platform. And the only reason I had a platform is that I did something for free and gave it away and got more visible. And I had no idea that was a good career plan until it worked out. Well, you've hit on something just... I, I talk about all the time is just you just got to do you just got to take a step don't think it's got to be perfect just go out there and and create engage find an audience and that sounds precisely what you did well, you know, and my, one of the, the person who had a great influence on me in this approach to therapy, I was talking about this alternate approach, was a guy named Milton Erickson who was a psychiatrist and hypnotherapist. And he told me one time, if you fall on your face, at least you're heading in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because I had no idea what I was doing, both in writing and in doing this newsletter and, you know, and being a speaker. And I fell on my face a fair amount, but each time I was heading in the right direction because I was taking action as you say, moving forward, putting myself out in the world, learning from those mistakes and the brick walls that I hit, and making connections. And those connections, some of them are still with me and make a big difference in how successful my writing career has been. So when do you think you first realized you'd figured out this entrepreneur thing? Well, first, I will say, I did not really step into the identity of being an author at first. I just wrote books. And I thought the authors were those, you know, I had, I, I suppose, the image that a lot of people have. You know, the guys who's smoking a pipe and drinking <laughs> some scotch at a typewriter with the patches on the elbows of his sport coat. And um, not the, I didn't not, not think the, of myself. Not the Hunter S. Thompson model? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Well, that was a different model. Model that I had when I was a hippie, but um, yeah, not exactly the Hunter Thompson model. He was a little more wild about that when that was gonzo journalism years later. But I really had this idea of author, and I, you know, and someone said, someone introduced me one time as an author, and I was like, oh, no, no, I just write books. And then something pivotal, two things pivotal happened. One is I come from a big Irish Catholic family, and you know, so my, when my first book came out, I, of course, I got, I got some free copies from the publisher and I sent them to every one of my family. And that's a lot of books. I have seven brothers and sisters. And I sent one to my, to my mother. My father wasn't alive at that point. And um, my mother called me a couple, of, a couple of years later. And, you know, after the first book, my family was kind of impressed. Wow, Bill wrote a book. But I'd send him the next couple of books. I started writing a book a year about. And about three or four years later, my mother called me. She had three or four of my books by then. And she'd gone to visit my aunt. Who my aunt was in Gary, Indiana, this very industrial place. And my mother had brought my books to show my aunt. And the next door neighbor, who was the aunt's best friend, came over because she'd seen my mother visit over the years and just to have coffee. And when she saw the books on the table, she said, oh, Hanlon, is that any relation to you? And she said, oh, yeah, that's my son. And she said, you know someone who's an author? My son, the author. <laughs> yeah, my mother said, yeah, this is my son. And she, she just cried. She said, I love books so much. I've never met anybody who knows an author. And you know the author of four books, and he's your son. And I met him when he visited here. She was so, my mother came home and, you know, called me and said, the weirdest <laughs> thing happened. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'm an author. And th that was the first time I stepped into that. I'm an author. And the second time was when Oprah asked me to be on her show and people started to sit up and take notice. Wow, this guy's a book author. And, and they started to treat me differently when I said I have this many books out. By then it was 17 books that I had when I was on Oprah and one got on Oprah. 
and um, she, and people started to notice and then they started to introduce me oh bill's an author and he's been on oprah and i realized that's not the way i think of myself but that's the way other people are thinking of me so that was one big shift for me in my identity really and i still think of myself as an author to this day but i do many other things i imagine um appearing on oprah would have um um been an, an incredible uh boost <laughs> to your identity as an author like um i'm trying to search for the word um you're verified as an author on, on national television validated yeah. yes i suppose validated and it sold a boatload of books which yeah. was nice to support and then it made it easier to sell every next book what's the one thing that uh, uh, interests me um what's the one thing you recall from from being on Oprah? what's a standout um memory if you like well, it was a little weird, but she hadn't read the book. <laughs> That's fine. But she had a great staff, and the producer had read it and prepared everything for it, and she had it on the teleprompter. And she's so smart that by the end of at the beginning of the of the show, she didn't quite get the concept. By the end of the show, she was like an expert in it. And better than I was at coaching people. She had some people in the audience kind of use the approach. That was the first thing. The second thing was that my, the book was published by a major New York publisher called Harper Collins. First, it was published by William Morrow, which was bought by uh, by your countryman uh, who bought a, a bunch of uh, book publishing, um, Rupert Murdoch. Oh, yes. and, um, Oh. And so I transferred to Harper Collins before the book came out, actually, um, because uh, Rupert Murdoch had bought it, and um, I said to the, you know, I was really excited about this book, and I'd written a bunch of books for therapists, but this was the second one I'd written for the general public, and I thought, well, this has a chance to be on Oprah, and that was the, you know, the brass ring everybody wants to be on there when it was the big show, and um, I said to the publicist at Harper Collins, well, what will it take to get me on? She, she said, there's no way you're going to get on Oprah, Bill. Just don't even, don't even dream about it. You know, she said, she said we give numbers to authors, you know, who want to get on Oprah. Call this number. It's 1-800-PRAYER-LINE. So <laughs> you're not going to get on there. And I said, no, really, I will do whatever I need to do. And she goes, no, if you bug Oprah's people, they'll never take one of our books again. You just have to back off. I said, well, you're going to do anything? She says, well, yes we'll send him the book and we'll send him your you know publicity kit and that was it and i was like okay don't and uh you know i told that to my agent and my agent called me and said call the publicist at harper collins she called me she's trying to get a hold of you um you know she called me on my cell phone but they only had my house phone and i wasn't answering that i was deep in the middle of writing something and she said you know call this uh publicist and I called the publicist and she said Oprah's producer one of Oprah's producers called me she's only there for five more minutes call her now they want you on the show so she said but I just have to warn you they sometimes want people on the show and then they interview them and then they change their mind or something gets knocked off the schedule so don't get your hopes up too much so I called the producer and we had a really nice chat and she said yeah I want to do this and so that you know was I, so I got to know her, and after I was on the show, I said, you know, can you tell me how I got on the show? Because my publicist said it wasn't going to happen. You know, it was very unlikely. She said, Oprah got mad because we were trying to change people's lives, and instead of changing people's lives, we'd give them free, you know, limo to drive their kids to soccer, drive their kids to school, uh, a maid service to do the laundry and clean the house, and when we go and visit them a week later, or two weeks later, or a month later, or two months later, they were depressed because they were no longer had the chauffeur and the maid service and their 15 minutes of fame was gone. So Oprah said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to give people gifts. We're going to make each show about changing one thing in, some, in the viewer's life. And my book had just arrived and the producer held it up across the table to Oprah and it was called Do One Thing Different. She said, that's what I'm talking about. Book Perfect. It. So, and that was not my title for the book initially so it was total kismic total fate that I was on there and it made a big difference yes it's uh, <clears throat> pardon me you've, you've had an incredible journey from um, you know from university and college from 
being frightened to write your first book to getting it published to getting on Oprah. You, you've also become a successful teacher and coach, um, coaching people how to write and publish books. So tell me a bit about how that, that came about. Because, you know, I was, I, I really, I was, it was like blood on the keyboards, the first book for me. I hated to write. I loved to have written, but I hated to write. And I had to rewrite that book literally 38 times. And it was still not great. I don't think the first book. And um, I just really disliked writing. And then I disliked it less the second book. And by the 17th book, I hate to say this to listeners because I think I was a really hard case. Um, I would much rather talk than write at that time. And um, I just finally locked in and I figured out how to write a book. And I wrote a book in a week. Wow. Now, before it had taken me three years for the first book, about a year for each book after that. It varied a little, nine months to a year and a half. And all of a sudden, I woke up one day, and it's, you know, I know you talk about this, and you've, you know, you've helped people with this. They talk about your writer's voice. And I don't know what happened, but for my first 16 books, I did not have a writer's voice. I was trying to write what was in my heart and my head, and I just couldn't get it out in a way. And eventually, after I rewrote it, you know, 20 times or 15 times or 7 times or whatever it turned out to be after a while, not 38 times like the first one, that was really torture, I started to get a sense, uh, you know, I would eventually get my voice, but it wasn't easy. And all of a sudden, one day, I woke up, and I... I just knew how to write differently than I had been writing before, and I found a true joy in it. And uh, so, you know, I went on to write 35 books. And on the way to that, people would say, wow, you've written so much. I want to write a book. How do I do that? And so, I am the kind of person who, once I learn something, I feel compelled to share it with the world. And I couldn't do that with as many people who wanted my help. So, I made, that's how you and I met, I made an online course and I, and I learned how to market it. And you and I were in a marketing course yeah. together. And um, we have learned a way to invite people. And weirdly, it goes back to my early days of doing that newsletter. It's partly based on giving stuff away and being generous with people and developing relationships with people. And so, this marketing method. So, I started to give stuff away and then charge for some of my teaching and coaching. And um, so, that's how I fell into it. It was not my intention to teach writing. And again, before I thought of myself as a writer, now I think of myself as a book coach and I've coached over 200 um, books into publication, mostly nonfiction, a few children books and a few novels but mostly nonfiction, which is what i specialize in and that segues nicely into uh <laughs> what what um we're here to talk about is your upcoming book writing and publishing course so yes. can you tell us a bit about that bill what's the backstory to the course yeah the backstory to the course is that i started to teach it live because again I was traveling around speaking so I would do a book writers boot camp a five day intensive I charged thousand US and people had to you know, fly to where I was, and which it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they'd have to rent a hotel room, and it was quite expensive. There were only a few people who could do it, and I can only take 10 people, and, you know, because I just really needed to intensively work with them, and a bunch of books got published out of that, but after a while, I got so busy, I didn't want to do that anymore, but people were still asking me to do this, and I discovered online stuff, and I just did a, a major brain dump of everything I know about how to get yourself to write, how to figure out what book you're supposed to write, how to organize yourself so that the book is easier to write and easier to sell, how to approach agents and, and publishers if you want to uh, get published by them, how to do ebooks and and self-published print books if you want to do that, and, um, you know, and how to get the book out there and be visible and do the marketing for it. So, I just put everything I could in there, and then I get a group of people and those people that are, you know, it's just a small group. It's not 10 people, but it's smaller than the thousands of people that actually are interested in this decide they're going to step up and actually pay for my time and my services. And uh, then I do personalized coaching with them on the web. And then I do a bunch of coaching calls as part of that. And uh, I find it absolutely exhilarating because 
because I was able to systematize and create this whole system and people could go through it at their own rate and their own pace, wherever they live. I have a bunch of people in Australia that have taken the course. And um, it's much better than my live uh, presentations because it's way more organized and they can go over the material again and again and again. It's really intense. We could, we're together for three months and they can download the whole course at the end, but we're together for three months with the coaching and me really encouraging them and giving them feedback because people are often, even though I teach this stuff, people, when they start to apply it, they need a little guidance and tweaking. And so that's what I do. And so I do it once a year and I really, really love it. I can do it from the comfort of my home and they can do it from the comfort of their homes. It's um, <clears throat> it's a fantastic course and highly recommended to, to our listeners. Hey, can you talk a bit about how, how the uh, coaching part works in the course? Is that just via Skype or... Uh, no, well, um, yes, Skype can be part of it, but uh, the first thing is that I, I break it into, it sounds terrible, it sounds like that old movie, What About Bob, but I break it into baby steps. <laughs> uh, baby steps, baby steps, Bob. Um, if you've ever seen that movie, that, that has a nice association for me, but um, it's very funny. But um, just small things. Each lesson is less than 10 minutes, and you can go through it, you know, while you're having your morning tea or morning coffee or when your you know, kids have gone to bed late at night, whenever you have a moment and I drip the content out over the course of six weeks and so it really because people get overwhelmed there's so much information and so much knowledge to pass on and then with each of those lessons I ask people to do one small piece of getting their book ready to be written starting to write their book starting to prepare the marketing and publicity and how to sell the book either as an ebook or a self-published print book or as a, a published book where they're going to seek a publisher and an agent so um, I give them feedback as they're posting their small little responses to those small little lessons so that's written and it's on the web and it's in a course site and you, you probably know this course site Kajabi I use yeah. right now yeah. um, and so I can interact with them sort of like blog posts I can, they can post theirs and I can post a response and they get a chance to see it and everybody else gets a chance to see it because everybody's going to learn from this coaching. So there starts to be a community of support. You can try out your ideas, you can try out your titles and subtitles and chapter titles on other people as well as me and then you get feedback and then I get on the phone and or Skype or people can listen on the web and type in questions live um, eight times because there's eight modules, one for each module, and I usually throw in a couple of bonus calls. Um, and th those are recorded if you can't make the time. I make some of them appropriate for people in Australia, some of them appropriate for people in Europe, and all of them are appropriate for people in the U.S., which is you know my main market because I live here and I've been <laughs> traveling around teaching a lot here. You've um, created a wonderful sense of community with this course and I think that that's what's what's needed to, to to learn how to write and to learn how to publish is to to um have somebody like you having your back and giving good advice and you know having some of the wisdom of the group coming through well I mean it's what you do as well and you create a little community you create a community with this with this podcast and also I know you do other things but it's really hard to go it alone I know you did it first and I have it first and you there's there's such a learning curve. You stumble around way more than you have to. You reinvent the wheel. Why not find somebody who knows how to do it already, like you do, like I do, and why not gather around? A, I create an atmosphere of great support. This community is just really sweet and really supportive and accountability, too, because I think, you know, you've discovered this, I'm sure. For me, book writing and publishing is all about momentum. You know, you have those people that start a book and they stop or they've been dreaming about it for a long time and they don't take action yep. and I think that really even if you did five minutes a day towards learning about how to write a book and get it published or towards writing or towards preparing your book and as long as you keep momentum you know that I think you'll get there you know you just got to persist and keep your momentum going it's the people that stop and say oh I started a book five years ago and I put it in a drawer or it's on my hard drive and I haven't looked at it since. That is a bad sign. You got to have, and one of the ways to keep the momentum going is have a community.
community of accountability and support and have a guide, a teacher, you know, a mentor, a coach that can sort of pave the way for you and let you know when you're off the path. That's precisely right. And taking action every single oh, day. Just um, don't, don't sit back and wait for things to happen. Make them happen. Yeah, yeah. You, you must have some success stories from riders that have um, completed uh, the courses and coaching in the past. Could you, could you share some of the standout ones? <laughs> yes, the, well, I'll, I'll tell you the first one is actually before I taught anybody or coached anybody, I had figured it out. And again, I have this sort of, I don't know why, it was, it's, I wasn't a writer. I wasn't a natural speaker, I, uh, uh, but I'm naturally organized in my mind, not in life, but in my mind. I have an outline mind. And I had this uh, friend who was a therapist, and he and I traded sort of consultation. Whenever we get stuck on a case, we trade, you know, hey, I'm stuck on this case. Can you talk me through it? And he was great. He was like me, a possibility guy. He just never got discouraged, and he would always come up with a new idea, and i like, okay, I'll try that. Thanks. He's a very encouraging guy. His name was Warren Burland. And one time he was talking, I was asking him about this couple I was working with I was a bit stuck with in my therapy. Um, and he said, well, I would use this out-of-the-box method. And he described to me this method that he'd come up with. He'd been studying with the you know spiritual masters and all the spiritual books for years, like 25 years. And he found a way to get his clients in psychotherapy to the deepest most profoundly peaceful and wise spiritual place they had within themselves within five minutes or less. And I was like, Warren, you have to write a book about this. And he just looked at me and said, are you crazy? You write books. I don't write books. I've never written a word. I don't have any knowledge of how to write or publish. I said, well, I do, and I've created this whole system for how to do it for myself. I've just never used it with anybody else. You can be my test case. And he, he resisted at first. He was like, there is no way. I'm way too busy. I don't know how to do this. I wouldn't know what should go in the book. And I said, I'll walk you through everything. And I gave him this system that I developed for myself just because I was busy and needed to write my books faster that I developed. And he indeed did it. He also got a contract with HarperCollins. He got an agent in New York City. He'd never written a word. Wasn't a known person. Person. And he had a PhD, so that's better than I have. I have a master's degree. So he had a little credibility in terms of that, but he'd never written, he'd never spoken, and he got a $30,000 advance, and that book went on to publish, and actually it got translated a bunch of uh, places, and it's really a big seller in Japan. I, he he says it's the cover, but I think it's the book. <laughs> um, so he says, says it's a really great cover in Japan, and he had, he had been following the spiritual teacher, traveling all the roads, following this guy and his, his wife was always complaining that he had credit card debts from following this guy and taking time off work and he got enough money to pay off his credit card debts and his wife was really really happy <laughs> and so was he obviously that's uh, incredibly from inspiring. the Japanese uh, from the Japanese sales alone so that's cool well it just goes prove that your book writing and publishing course actually works we, we talked before um, briefly about the three tasks of the author what are they well, the first one is to bring your raw energy and your unique slant. I have a son in the music business, stepson in the music business, and when he was starting out, he was like, oh, everybody's trying to get a record contract. He said, this is the thing. The record companies need you. So do the book companies. If they could write their own books with artificial intelligence, I guarantee you they would be doing it. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> they would automate the process and cut you, the author, out. But they can't. They need your human creativity and your raw energy and the unique slant you have on your top on your fiction or your nonfiction. Nobody else is going to write like you. If you can truly find your energy, and you're going to need a lot of energy, and I say there's four kinds of energies. Blissed, what do you love? Blessed, who sees something in you and encourages you and says, you ought to write a book about that, or that's a great idea like I did with my friend Warren. Pissed and dissed are the other ones. And pissed, I don't mean drunk. Um, I mean pissed off like I was. I wrote a book because I was pissed off and wanted to change the world. And dissed, where have you been hurt or disrespected that's made you sensitive to some topic? And some fiction writers write their books out of being dissed. I know, um, you know, Lee Child, one of the most well-known, you know, thriller writers. Oh, I'm, uh, a big, I'm a big fan of Lee. I am a big fan yeah. of his. The, 
the reason he started writing because he was so pissed off at his bosses at Granada Television who'd fired him and basically undermined him. And every time he kills somebody in one of those Reacher books, <laughs> he's thinking of his old management, his old bosses. And so he was not only pissed, but dissed. He was disrespected. And that sensitized him to a certain kind of issue. So that's the first task of an author is you've got to bring your raw energy and your uniqueness to this project. Nobody else is going to be able to bring that. So nobody else can write the book you can write second thing you have to organize yourself edit it get it written you know get it written and edit it you probably need to find your writing rituals you need to find how to outline a structure or get somebody who has a uh, outlining and structuring mind and then you need bum glue as as bryce <laughs> courtney your uh, countryman said that this when someone asked him how he, he wrote so many books he said bum glue i glue my bum to the chair and i write there's no other magic you have to sit down and write but then you have to edit and rewrite and most writing is rewriting as you know because both of us have done a fair amount of it what comes out on the raw page you need to get that out there because you have to have something besides a blank screen or a blank page um, but then you have to rewrite it and work with it then the third task and some people when i coach them and teach them they don't like this they say oh i just want to write the book and i say no you have two other tasks you need to organize you need to edit it and make sure it's the best it can be and then your third task is to get yourself or the book visible and you need to get it published so you need to learn about the publishing process whether it's ebooks or self-published print books or is finding a publisher an agent and you need to get it visible and in order to do that you mentioned this word earlier platform you need to develop a platform and a platform is just something like a physical platform if you had a hundred auth potential authors or authors who've written books and you were able to stand on a platform in the same room they were in, if a publisher or a reader walked in and they could see your head above the crowd, they'd they notice you more than they notice somebody else. So your job is to develop a platform and in, you know, out of the metaphor, this is anything that makes you more visible or makes your book more visible. So that's doing interviews like I'm doing with you now. It's doing a blog. It's um, going out and doing a speaking tour or um, you know, a book publicity tour. It's um, putting a, a video on Facebook every day with your thoughts on some topic that's related to your book or just that gets you well known, something you're passionate about. So I think there's really three parts to this last thing of getting it published and visible or getting yourself visible. And that's doing the platform, as we just talked about. You need a great proposal if you're going to get it published by a publisher. If you're going to e publish, you don't need to do that. Although I do write proposals for my ebooks and self print self published books print books because it helps me organize myself before I write and before I do the marketing campaign and then you need to know the pitch after I was on Oprah, I did 40 radio interviews about that book because there was a lot of interest. And by the end of those 40 interviews, I knew how to say what my book was about in 25 words or less. And I wished I could have gone back and rewritten the book based on this new clarity. So when I coach people, I say, you need to get the clarity before you write the book. It's going to make the book easier to write, faster to write. And it's going to make it easier to sell to your readers if you're doing an ebook or a self published book, to an agent or a publisher if you're doing a, a publisher represented book. But I think also getting the the elevator pitch clear in your head it it yes. so it focuses your writing as well what what the book's about. That's, um, it, I well I have discovered that when I went from that three years for the first book to one year for the second book the major difference was I had pre thought about the second book for a couple of years and I had a really good outline that first book I was working out the outline and the contents while I was writing and I was in a muddle a lot of times I got lost a lot and that's true with fiction writers and nonfiction. A few fiction writers write without a script or a structure or, you know, an outline, but I think that's a dangerous process. There's very few that can get away with it. Most people have an outline definitely true for nonfiction. And I just got faster and better at making really clear pitches. That is, I would pitch to myself. I would really get clear on what it was and really great focus and organization. And then the book was way easier to write. And that one I wrote in a week, I usually write a book in three or four weeks, a nonfiction book at this point. And, you know, that one week was a little anomaly. It was a very short book too. But the reason I could do that is I knew exactly what was in that book and I was totally clear about it before I wrote. And I'd found my voice, which made the writing a bit easier. And you've developed an incredible process for doing that, which, of course, 
um, I, segues I, back I, into the book I <laughs> taught and myself. I'm a you know a two finger typist. I'm not the fastest typist, and I just can barely keep up with my thoughts as they're flowing out of my head when I'm writing a book because I've thought about it for a year or two before I've written it, and I and the outline is helping me write it really fast as well. So yeah, I got much faster at writing, so that's helpful. I think it's a good point to wrap it up, Bill. I just want to thank you for coming in the show. Um, of course, have to do it. If people are listening, right, you know, when this comes out, um, there's still I have a series of three free videos they can watch to get an overview and go into more detail than we were able to. But in a couple of days, I'm going to start that yearly course, and Fantastic. you know, if they're if they're if they're listening for the next week or so, they can get in on that course. Otherwise. I will see you in 2017 if you want to get in on the course. It's going to be a year. I only do it once a year. I'm very clear on that because I want time to write my other books and to do my music, as uh, you and I talked about at the very beginning. Well, dear listener, I highly recommend, highly commend you, um, Bill O'Hanlon's book writing and publishing course. Bill's uh, put together a little, um, in the business we call them, a sales page I suppose um, that you can jump into the course to find out more about it and if you want to get a pen it's getyourbookwritten.com backslash revolution because this is of course the ebook revolution that you're tuned into Um, Bill it's been a pleasure Um, thank you again if any listener wants to uh, find out more about uh, yourself Bill apart from the Get your book written dot com slash revolution. Uh-huh. You can, of course, hop on to Bill O'Hanlon dot com and um, and they can write me at Bill at get your book written dot com. So just you know, drop me in, drop me a line. And again, if you've missed it for this year, if it's past the sixth of February uh, down there in uh, Australia, you're going to miss the course this year. I'm sorry because it starts on that date here in the U.S. Uh, it starts on the f- the registration ends on the fifth, and the course starts on the sixth here. So um, if it's past that, just you know, go to getyourbookwritten.com and get on the mailing list, and you'll hear about it next year. So yeah, you still got you some so time. Thank you so much, Jeff, for for uh, having me on. It's always uh, we we really connected over the book stuff and also music, and it's really nice to speak to you. And I appreciate you having me on, Bill. Thanks very much. I look forward to seeing more of your uh, music videos. Okay, thanks. You've been listening to uh, the Ebook Revolution with Bill O'Hanlon, and um, tune in next time. Find us on iTunes or on the Stitcher Network. If you do listen to us on Stitcher, uh, please leave a review because um, reviews the lifeblood of iTunes. And the more we get, the better we rank and we can get the message out. So that's it for us. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And, of course, uh, you can uh, get the show notes for um, my interview with Bill O'Hanlon and more information about uh, get your book written.com slash revolution uh, on the show notes to the podcast which uh, back on the website uh, www.madhousemedia.com.au slash podcast and um, we're up there on episode 13 below Hanlon so you can get all the information there thanks again for listening see you next time mm-hmm.